So, John, we left it on the cliffhanger of everybody looking at Jesus uh, in our previous episode. Uh, But what we want to do to jump in now to the follow-up as to what actually goes on in this Nazareth synagogue, it all all rotates around how Jesus has presented Isaiah 61 to them, doesn't it? So what we're kind of thinking to do to sort of start this episode off is before we look at the response to Jesus' sermon on Isaiah 61, is to maybe just jump to I to the relevant portion of Isaiah 61 quickly so we can have all of that in our mind. Because Luke has told us that Jesus has quoted it, but that's how Jesus quotes it is of interest to us, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, for sure. And and of course, our, our listeners may know that Isaiah 61 it, in our Bible has around about 11 verses, mm-hmm. but But it's the first few verses in terms of where Jesus stops that really are of interest. So Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, that's sort of where Jesus stops. But then Isaiah goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus literally stops (laughs) mid-sentence. To comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called the oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And that magnificent passage continues on in sort of Mm. similar vein. So you have this, if you were comparing Luke and what Jesus says in the synagogue and what Isaiah says, Jesus has this dramatic sort of halfway through a, sentence stopping and he stops it proclaim the year of the lord's fame with within that so so there is this oh what's that about and then of course as he begins to teach it all goes it all gets very interesting and i think it's worth just reiterating this is a very literate uh in ter- literate not in terms of a reading congregation but it literate in terms of an awareness of scripture yeah. congregation so yeah. this is what you do, you go to synagogue, you learn and memorize this. So I, I kind of wonder if you were, uh, you know, a Christian listener, if I was to say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch, and then walked off and, you know, started to talk about something else. There's almost that slight discomfort that you've not finished yeah. this properly yes. there's a there's a there's a story that, that that Mozart when he was little and it sounds like Mozart was quite often quite a horrible person but he his father had taught him music and Mozart apparently used to when his dad had gone to bed he would play a tune but not play the final note, right? So he would play this tune and then stop. And apparently his dad would have to get up and come downstairs and play the final note on the piano because otherwise it just it just grated on him that, that, that it hadn't been finished properly. It feels weird for somebody to stop mid-sentence through a famous hymn. Mm. The congregation are gathered in the synagogue. And Jesus, these words are so familiar, we know them. Release from darkness for the prisoners, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. And Jesus says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it, and it, it sort of hangs there. Yeah. And I think that's why everybody's looking at him. Like, did you really exactly. just stop there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and we alluded to this last time, Isaiah 61, this passage is a very, very dynamic passage in terms of understanding the year of God's favor, this jubilee, mm. this idea of the Lord announcing a jubilee of freedom over his people, delivering them from their oppressors. Mm. And so the, if, if you read the whole of the chapter, there is an intermingling with the idea of deliverance that's Mm -hmm. absolutely there but also with vengeance Mm. so you get this unusual combination that god will bring deliverance by wreaking also vengeance Mm. on the enemies of of god's people 
Mm-hmm. And so, look, if you if you look at in verse 4 of Isaiah 6, one, they'll rebuild the ancient ruins, that's God's people, mm-hmm. and restore the places long devastated. And then it goes on to say, verse 5, strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and your vineyards, and you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. goes on to say, instead of your shame, you will receive double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance, mm. so that you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. So you get this this sense of a juxtaposition taking place. That remember, Isaiah originally writes, and this language is is towards post exilic. This is this idea of mm. deliverance, this idea of re- rescuing mm. God's people. Not only is the Lord going to rescue them, mm. but the foreigners and the strangers actually are going to end up serving them and the wealth of the nations will become the possession of the people of God. So it isn't just a comforting God will deliver you, but it is a dynamic God will deliver you by also wreaking vengeance Mm. on your oppressors, who of course happen to be Gentiles. (laughs) And that is where we are about to head literally, literally towards the edge of a cliff because Mm. Jesus is about to set something up which is absolutely off the scale Mm. in terms of controversy. Mm. And if our listeners can understand that the Isaiah 61 backdrop is one of not only deliverance, but vengeance. And the focus of that vengeance is Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Fast forward that to the first century world and you've got a Jewish community who are exiled in their own country. They're under the oppression of Rome. And when they read Isaiah 61, they're thinking of the Romans and getting rid of the Romans. Remember, Mm -hmm. Galilee was... Jewish enclave surrounded by Gentiles just Mm -hmm. across the Galilee. You've got the 10 cities almost entirely inhabited by Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So you've got a sense of a nation under siege. And Isaiah 61 was one of those passages of comfort Mm -hmm. that they would say, God is going to deliver us and he's not just going to deliver us. He's going to judge our oppressors and he's going to drive the Gentiles out of our land. Mm -hmm. If you can get that, then, then understand the first century context of oppression and exile in their own nation and then come to Jesus' very different interpretation of this passage. We have an explosion waiting to go here. Mm-hmm. This is absolutely off the scale in terms of controversy and that will help our listeners to understand why we go from people thought well of him at the mm-hmm. beginning of this discourse, to they tried to kill him. Mm-hmm. Something happens between the end of the reading and the explanation of the reading that causes the, the synagogue inhabitants to try and kill a member of their own community, mm-hmm. which points to a blasphemous idea. They're pointing to something so extreme that they're prepared to kill in order to obliterate that idea. Mm. It's, it's pretty spectacular, really. So Jesus reads this passage from Isaiah 61, ends halfway through the sentence, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and he rolls up the scroll. So he's, he's <laughs> it's, so it's like, oh, we're not coming back to this. It's, yeah, not, so, it's, not, it's not like, well, I've, I'm just going to pause in mid-sentence here and explain something to you. No, no, I'm done with that now. And he sits down. So, so everyone's like, oh my goodness, did he just do that? Because it's not just that he finished, as you say, in the middle of a sentence. It's the, it is the sentence that he finished in the middle of, which yeah. is quite, quite controversial. So all the eyes of the synagogue are fixed on him. And Luke picks it up in verse 21. And then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, I think that's a beautifully fascinating comment, John, that, that exactly what scripture is he talking about? Well, what he's read, yeah. which, is, which is interesting. And then it says all, and I, I wonder about some of the translations here, and I'm, I'm not a translation expert, John, but, but I wonder if this might be better referenced, all witnessed of him right, or all yeah. bore testimony about him. I sometimes wonder if the language of everyone speaking well of him just pushes it a little, a little too far. But, um, but, but you know, we we can come back to that, and and you might read that Greek a little differently from me. But, but, but all all bore witness to him and were amazed at the gracious words, words of grace, not which words of, of of vengeance that came out of his mouth. But then notice this in verse twenty two. Then they said, "Is this 
is not this Joseph's son? Well, that's a mm. that's an interesting little addition that we, we we need to kind of spin back and 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 reflect on just just shortly. Jesus said to them, "Surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum." Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Mm. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All of the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of a hill in which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Mm. <laughs> and I love the fact that if you read just a little further, he, he went down to Capernaum, the very place that they just <laughs> just criticized him for. The next verse. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and interesting, actually, just as a point, he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he taught the people. And they yeah. were amazed at his teaching mm. because his mm. words had authority. So mm. his, you really do see this prophet is not accepted at, at home. <laughs> so sure. like, what a text, John, what a text. Well, it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful because I, I think the idea is that you've alluded to him rolling up the scroll, the sense of I am done with the reading mm -hmm. and I want to say something from that, which is clearly the tonation of his words are clearly picked up because mm -hmm. they, they talk about the graciousness of his words. There's mm -hmm. a, there's a, a tenderness, there's a softness, there's a generosity to his words, mm -hmm. because I, as I suspect, this this would have been a bit of a firebrand passage, mm -hmm. railing against the Gentiles. And then, of course, Jesus is, I think he's setting up here the idea where he is he is anticipating the reaction he is about to get. And, and it doesn't make sense until he tells us why, until he gets to the heart of his explanation. And of course... The heart of the explanation, he, he's telling us two hero stories involving Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So you've got the widow of Sarafath, so a poor marginalized woman, but a Gentile woman nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is essentially a bit sort of almost tongue in cheek. Weren't there? Weren't there lots of widows in Israel? Mm -hmm. So why why does he go there? What why is why is it a widow who's Gentile looking after the man of God? And of course, you, the Elijah allusion there to mm -hmm. the Messiah, I think, is unmissable for that first century world. And then the second example is Elisha and Naaman. And of course, there's this uncomfortable correlation potentially between Naaman, who was an an army captain. Mm -hmm. seeking to oppress the people of Israel at the time, an enemy of Israel, and of course the fact that Israel is still under military occupation. Mm -hmm. There's this, oh, that's an awkward example. But yes. but what's striking is that, that Naaman is the only leper healed mm -hmm. officially on the record under the ministry of Elisha. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus is holding up two... Gentile examples with two of the greatest prophet heroes in Tanakh. Mm. And what he's saying there is an unmissable message, which ultimately yes. gets the sort of reaction that he gets. That actually, I haven't come to judge the Gentiles. Mm. I'm not going to drive the Romans out, mm -hmm. but I'm going to include them in. I'm not going to drive away the Gentiles from this this message, I'm actually going to include them in. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the Gospel of Luke, especially, you, you get a lot of, and the Book of Acts, you get, you get a number of centurion mm -hmm. repeats. You know, you literally get centurion sold referenced in in the in the Lucan text. And is that is that another allusion to this this controversial sermon? And Gentiles, including Gentiles, is one thing. But the illusion of a military occupying force mm -hmm. also 
being included in this message is probably too much for the audience and sends yes. them over the edge. And <laughs> of course, they try to send him over the edge as well. Quite, quite literally. But it's interesting for me how he is, how the whole story is sort of working its way together here, John, isn't it? That, that we are seeing quite literally the, the Lord's favor extending. Yes. And then Jesus is sort of saying, well, that's not new. Um, that that's the one side of it. The kind of less insulting side of it is that that's not new, but there's yeah. definitely also this this realization that perhaps what the listeners are valuing isn't as valuable as they thought it was. So it's very interesting how Jesus pieces this together. And and I think, I mean, John, for me, this passage to make sort of sense of it. Again, you have to sort of zoom out almost to this whole season that we've done mm. about the beginning of Jesus's ministry, because there's a lot of stuff going on here in the synagogue that we've seen alluded to and happened throughout the passages of the season, isn't there? Indeed. And I think that, you know, so just like have a look at some of these things together. Jesus has come from a testing in the desert mm -hmm. with the devil, yep. and now he yep. comes back to his hometown. I don't, don't. Don't dismiss that. And Jesus is going to draw direct attention to this. Listen, trying to get some respect in your hometown, that's kind of difficult, right? So so actually, is there a way of reading Luke 4 that this is another level of testing that's mm. going on? So mm. God has opened the, the chapter with, with this is my son. Right? This is the opening sort of concept is that Jesus is, is back to this is my son. And he's, 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 he's full of, well, not the chapter, open the passage really that we're, we're dealing with, right? So, so the Holy Spirit descends a voice, you are my son whom I love and well pleased, right? So we've talked throughout this season about how this is almost this framing idea that makes sense of yeah. the temptations. But don't notice, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then you get this genealogy. And we talked about how this is a sort of almost an honor challenge. Is, yeah. is Jesus who Luke is claiming Jesus to be? Well, just notice when we get back here, he gets through the devil, the devil, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, well, that's dealt with, isn't it? Well, yep. here we are in Luke two, Luke 4, 22, and notice what the people say. Well, isn't this mm. Joseph's son? And yep. I just think it's worth spotting that the devil's question is back on the table again in a Not slightly really. different way. Are you the son of God? It, it's there, yeah. isn't it? Oh, totally. And of course, if you've been following the breadcrumbs, he was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. Mm. So that preempts the genealogy. Yes. And then you get a direct, it's almost a, another little look and symmetry moment. Mm -hmm. So you've got the words of the father, the words of the adversary, the devil. Mm -hmm. There's a symmetry in that. You are my son, if you are the son. And then another little moment of symmetry around his honor and his name. Mm -hmm. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. And in the middle of announcing his, the beginning of his ministry, isn't this isn't this Joseph's son? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you, so you, there's a lovely little double symmetry, I think, around the identity of Jesus in that. Mm -hmm. And again, it reinforces this thread. And I think you're absolutely correct. This is another massive test mm -hmm. uh, of Jesus. And of course, we know from the Gospels that Jesus relocates the the hub of his Galilean ministry to Capernaum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he probably, it's probably Peter's house, probably mm -hmm. is the headquarters in a sense, forgive yes. that language. <laughs> but he, he does relocate. And there's I think there's lots of other reasons for that. But undoubtedly, one of the reasons is if there is such antagonism against him, mm -hmm. and Mark also picks up this idea in Mark 6, if there's such antagonism against him, in his hometown, he he could not function effect in that in that place, mm -hmm. and so he relocates to Capernaum, and that becomes his sort of launch pad for the yes. for the Galilean stage of his ministry. So you're absolutely right. I I do think it's another layer of test. And and if you read it in this particular way as an honor challenge, and we've talked about that throughout this this, so I don't need I don't want to jump too far into that, but if it is an honor challenge. Jesus's quite sharp response makes more sense. Yeah, if if you true. miss how much is hanging on this, well, isn't this Joseph's son? Because mm. if you miss that, it seems like this kind of really inspiring moment gets out of hand really quickly. Like yeah. Jesus seems to just launch straight into an insult. 
right? But of course, actually, it's a response to an insult leveled at him that mm-hmm. is not just simply we don't know who your dad is, or you don't know who your dad is, or at Luke's level, we don't think your dad is who your dad actually is, right? So there's all that. <laughs> but but what this is also doing is saying to Jesus, we don't think you get to talk like this, right? Mm. Because you don't get to redefine how we read this text. You don't get to speak in at this level. And I think, but maybe we do, right? And we, so yeah. if you can't read it like that is another way of saying, no, we get to keep reading it like we do, which I yeah. think is why Jesus then comes back with his response to the honor challenge, which is to, which is to not to question it's a very clever response from Jesus, actually, because it's not to question. He doesn't say, well, you're not Israelites either. He doesn't say you're not true followers of God. He doesn't say any of that. He just raises the question, maybe what you think is valuable isn't as valuable as you think it is. Yep. So you you think you're more special to God than everybody else. And I just want to point out that that might not hold water if you consider the scriptures. It's yes. It's quite a... It's quite a sharp challenge. Oh, completely. And and I think if we can see it like that, it explains then the trajectory of the sermon mm-hmm. and the trajectory of, of Jesus' words. Because physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we heard you did at Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his own town. And then he talks about two of the greatest prophets yes. of Israel, one who has undoubted messianic overtones in terms of preparation, Elijah. And both of them uh, experience one of their greatest miracles in the context of Gentiles recognizing them, mm-hmm. not not Jews. Yes, yes, it's quite so, nice. So the widow, I mean, if you read the original story, the Elijah and widow of Zarephath, there's a bit of pulling and pushing on that story. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, the woman like accepts the word of the prophet and goes, okay, then I'll, I'll make you this final meal and we'll see what happens. Mm. And she goes with it when she had every right to say, who are you? Take yourself off, get lost, go back to your home country. Why are you here? But she opens up her heart to him and she accepts. So it's a Gentile widow accepts a Jewish prophet. Mm. And then it is a Gentile commander that recognizes the authority of Elisha, mm. even though he tries to push back on the dirty Jordan, right? <laughs> and so, but but you've got a widow Gentile accepting the prophet, a a Gentile military commander accepting the prophet. Mm. And what Jesus is really leaning into here is, uh, and I think this is the barbed bit of it, which gets the reaction. He's saying, you're about to reject me, but but there's going to be widows, Gentiles, Romans, mm. people on the fringes of your world who are going to see who I am. They're going to yes. see that I am the prophet and, uh, and that I am the son of God and that I am who I, I say I am. Mm-hmm. And they're going to respond to that. So, so Jesus is not just, I think there's a double edge to this sermon, David, which gets yes. the reaction he gets. He's not just saying, hey, there's going to be no vengeance here, right? So, so the vengeance might eventually come, but I'm not bringing it. I'm bringing favor. That's the first controversial aspect where he rolls up a scroll. And then secondly, he explicitly then says, in the way that the widow Gentile accepted Elijah the prophet and the way that the military Gentile commander accepted Elisha, the Gentiles are going to accept me. Mm-hmm. And, and the danger is that those who should have known who I was will miss who I am. And I think that's where it goes ballistic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's exactly uh, how I would see it as well. It, it's quite something how the whole story kind of kicks around. And, and, and it's almost a sense that Jesus is is raising questions. If, if we hold on to this, this honor theme, he, he's almost asking the, the Nazareth crowd whether they understand 
mm-hmm. any of this sort of stuff. Like, like w- when they say, isn't this Joseph's son? And Jesus says, well, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. It's almost as if he's saying, but you all have got no shame. You don't understand any of it. And, and almost you don't understand any of this story from the baptism. Yeah sort of onwards. And I think the fact that it is an insult that Jesus throws at them, it's not simply a history lesson, is the fact that the people are furious when they hear what he said. Like this is, like this, you have pushed us too far here, Jesus. Like Because Mm -hmm. now they they need to be, they need to take a bit of humble pie because in the ancient world, insulting somebody's heritage is about as as bad as it gets. So so there is some, some, some real questions going on there. But it's also worth reading. I think if you're reading this alert to the kind of narratives of honor, shame in ancient culture, the when when somebody is um, is overly quick to violence in a, in an argument, that's yeah, often yeah. a symbol that they've lost the fight, right? Um, and that's still true in our world. If two people are arguing and then one of them punches the other, invariably the point at which somebody punches the other and forgive the violent story, but invariably that's when you can't think of anything else to say, right? So yeah. so you've been kind of bestied rhetorically, so now you're going to resort to violence. And even yeah. if you manage to kill the person and throw them over the edge of the cliff, everybody's going, eh, but like he outdid you and you did it because you were embarrassed at some level. So, so there's a weird sense that the crowd giving in to violence, uh, and let me try and draw some parallels here, but the crowd giving into violence to you, the reader, is a message that, that Jesus has again cornered them and st- uh, with mm-hmm. an inability to respond. Now, what I would say, John, at that point then is, where have we seen that before? <laughs> mm-hmm. And we saw it in exactly the previous story in the temptations in the wilderness, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Satan mm-hmm. fires a challenge at Jesus. Jesus meets the challenge with a piece of scripture. He meets, And I can't help but again notice that they got up and they took him to a high place. Yep. And the yep. devil kept taking Jesus to high places. And, and, and so his own hometown, I'm not drawing comparisons here, sorry, between his own town people and the devil to say that they were, I'm not saying there's anything demonic happening here, but we're seeing another level of the testing of Jesus following suit. And there is some beautiful irony, right? And again, I'm just pulling, stitching things together, John. I'm curious as to your thoughts on it. Think about the last temptation that the devil throws at Jesus. He's at high place, throw yourself down because God will command his angels concerning you. And the people take him to a high place to yep. throw him down, and he walks right through the crowd and goes on his way. I mean, I mean, it it it's not something I've heard many people join together, but I'm kind of seeing it and curious as to what you think. <laughs> oh, I love it! I love it. Uh, it may it may be we it may be we are accused of stretchiness, <laughs> but again, if you are reading the flow of this story without the chapter divisions, you couldn't miss that, mm. and you could not miss that. So. So again, is that is that just one of those weird, gorgeous, incidental moments, mm. or is this a deliberate piece of genius here mm. that's that's recorded for us that that actually Jesus refuses to throw himself off because he declares in that temptation, "No, I I trust in the presence of the Father. The mm. Father is with me. I am with Him." And of course, here's Jesus right in the center of the will of God. They're trying to destroy Him, and He experiences. Mm. Supernatural deliverance. Mm-hmm. He now it's not there's no there's no reference to angels here catching yeah. him, but there is a supernatural response. It, yes. I mean, he we don't quite know what this means, but he walked right through the crowd. Now mm. it's either at a, a purely human level, such confusion in <laughs> in the group that he sort of capitalizes on the confusion and gets away, yeah. or there's some sort of hey. Did anyone see him leave? Mm. Like, where is he? That somehow their eyes or their senses were dulled. But whatever it is, it's a fairly spectacular escape regarding how small the place is and the fury of the crowd. Mm. So so the allusion to the angels catching him or at least to God delivering him because mm-hmm. he has remained faithful yes. to the purpose of the Lord, I think is a beautiful, I don't think that's a stretch at all. I think yeah. that's a gorgeous little illusion. Well, and it's just this idea, isn't it, that that essentially Jesus now faces a range of challenges, supernatural 
evil challenges of the devil. Just this everyday life of just not being taken seriously at home. <laughs> you know, what I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, I think most of us would go. I can relate to at least one of one one of yeah. those one of those um, one of those sort of spots and one of those places. You know, and and yet both of them, the opposition taken to Jesus is unable to get its 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 claws into him. There, in, in the physical level, they physically just like where did he go? But from from the the temptations in the desert, the the devil basically has to give up. And and so I think yeah. Luke has, and this would be where well, maybe we've been building this over a few months to get to this point, but Luke has set up from the start where we picked up this story at Jesus's baptism, Jesus is the son of God. Yeah. And you can bring genealogies to that. You can bring the temptations of the devil. You can bring the people that he grew up around to that. And Luke now presents you to the ancient reader Yep. I think Jesus has passed all these tests. Yes. So so now you can be relatively confident of him having navigated these tests that he's now going to head off out into his ministry and mm-hmm. he is approved and tested. He has the seal on him. Yep. And, and it's interesting then that what you get is Jesus leaves, he goes to Capernaum yep. and boom, he's casting out demons. He's raising Peter's yep. mother-in-law from ill. All kinds of people are coming to be healed. It just, it all of a sudden accelerates really fast. You know, And the next thing, within a couple of verses, he's calling disciples to follow him and be trained yes. in this way. It's, it is almost Luke presenting Jesus's letter of recommendation to the ancient oh. world, isn't it? And of course, because I just thought you were going to allude to it there, but but when Jesus goes down to Capernaum, it says, verse 41, straight after this, moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going, boom. Yes. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, th- that's almost like a little follow on mm-hmm. here. So in following that thread of, of this honor and test and yes. approval and affirmation. Yes. Here we have in the words, the mouth of demons themselves. Yes. The ultimate yes. affirmation. Actually, you are who you say you are. Yes. You are the son of God. And and I love that. I think that's a lovely little, again, if we stop, if we stop at the headings. Yes. We miss that. But if we carry on reading from verse 38, right down to the end of the chapter, mm-hmm. then um, it's, it's absolutely uh, beautiful and 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 we we see that you are the son of god proclamation yes yeah and and it's interesting actually that if we could just as we sort of roll towards the end of this series or this season just jump then in luke to to chapter 23 and and notice how the people are watching jesus being crucified and notice mm-hmm. just this return of these questions. They said, they sneered at him and said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers come up and mock him and they offer him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? And so so there's this uh there, there's this question almost sort of hanging out there that that, that doesn't go away, does it? That people are, are constantly wanting to pick at the the temptation that Jesus faced, and it and and it's interesting how that question goes silent, and until yep. you get to the end, and Jesus is in a place of weakness, and yes. that question comes back again, and again, yes. just remember, and I'm just drawing. Pencil lines, John, not lines in pen. Yeah. Rem- look at how the temptations ended and this and the Satan left Jesus until an opportune time. And Indeed. it just strikes me as Jesus in his moment of weakness and, and dying on the cross, those same if temptations are now rolled back onto the table again. I don't know. I yeah, mean, what what do you think? Oh, it's beautiful. And of course, just the only, again, I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to land on this. The only other little addition I would, because that was magnificent mm. connection, beautiful, is is Luke 23 again, verse 47, in the mouth of a Gentile. Yes. Uh, that final statement, cer- sh- certainly the man, this man was righteous. He was a righteous man. Yes. So you get this again, if you want to connect it back to even even what we've talked about in mm-hmm. in the early stages of Luke, 
you're yes. you're getting Jesus being questioned by his own people, questioned by the Gentiles, which you would expect, but it is a Gentile affirmation here. Yes. Yes. That he's a righteous man, that there's something going on here. And and that is beautiful. I think that's beautifully looking. Yes. And of yes. course, ironically, if we connect it back to Luke 4, it just happens to be a soldier as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you've had you've had Naaman the prof uh, the Naaman the mm-hmm. soldier recognizing Elisha the prophet. Mm-hmm. You get you get in Luke seven the centurion recognizing I too am a man under authority. And here here is another uh, centurion, another Lucan centurion popping up and saying, actually, he was a righteous man. Mm-hmm. There's this beautiful almost completion of the story. Yes, that 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 there will be those who recognize him as God's prophet mm. who who had no right to recognize him, but they do. Yes. And alluded to in Jesus' great sermon, which almost got him killed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's lovely how Luke tells us that story. And maybe, you know, my hope is just even as we've tried to thread these pieces together throughout this, this season, in, which is perhaps different from our first two seasons, which were kind of, standing alone, although we were trying to tie them together from time to time. This one, there's a real sense of the whole thing stitching together in terms of what Luke is doing and 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 hopefully applicable to us as we navigate our own devotional lives to see some of these patterns and thought processes and, 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 and reflect and reflect on them. But I just couldn't leave the series without just jumping towards those points at the end just to just to spot how that question is the key the, the the kind of it's just a constant refrain in the testing of Jesus. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It's been a joy. I've loved this series. I I hope our listeners have enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed participating in it. Yeah. And again, I hope that we are both inspired and encouraged by the person of Jesus. We yeah. we believe he is the son of God. Yes. We believe he is God's Messiah and we believe that actually yeah. his power and his word can live in us in a 21st century world yeah. and carry on the work that he started. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's what I, I think there's huge model for us, isn't there in that John? And even even I should have mentioned it earlier as well, but you know, just notice Jesus's response, all of these if statements and his crucifixion, if you're the Messiah, if you say you are. But just, you know, verse 46 of Luke 23, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, Father. into your hands I commit my spirit. So there's even there's that, there's that little piece of teaching there from Luke of just reminding us that if you are Jesus, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, but Jesus still confesses what's true in the face of, of doubters and, and surrounded by people who would question that. And, and, and that, I think that's a model. Our own identity as followers of Jesus is so fragile feeling sometimes. And notice how Jesus in his fragility just keeps speaking what he knows to be true. This is oh, my so son good. in whom I'm well pleased. It's so good. And, and in fact, one, one other little connector to that, David, is that it, the, the words of Jesus on the cross from Luke, both the beginning words and the end words, mm-hmm. are Father. Yes. So yes. Father, forgive them is the opening words. In fact, chronologically, that's the opening words. Yes. And then he ends with Father and sandwiched in the middle are words to mm-hmm. a criminal. Yeah. Today you'll be Quite with something. me. And you just you just go, okay, so again, bringing it back to where we are, you have this incredible security that Jesus has in and with his relationship mm. with his father. And the purpose of that relationship is to redeem the margins mm-hmm. and bring them into the paradise of God. And and those three statements on the cross seem to summarize in mm-hmm. Luke's worldview. Yeah. Seem to summarize those dynamic and beautiful and glorious tensions. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it, John. So, so we we will round this series out here. We're back in two weeks' time with a couple of interesting bonus uh, episodes. We're not going to tell you about them just yet, but you're going to want to be back with us for a couple of bonus episodes before we jump into our next season. So we bring this Jesus Begins series to an end, but there's so much more still to say. <laughs> Absolutely.